Good morning. We will discuss today an important matter. We read in the parasha yesterday, well, everybody knows about the, the Gizera, the decree, the verdict of Paro. Kolabena ilodai orata shlichuhu. He said, that's it. He declares an edict of extermination. A real Hitler. For all the newly born, even though the main idea was the Jewish newborn, but in order to implement his plan, he was willing to sacrifice even the newly born of the Egyptians. As long as that it will serve his politics in a way that people will not think that it is, he is doing it for the hatred that he has against the Jewish people. So he's willing. Lo and behold, we see this almost every time. The hatred against the Jewish people is so deep that the nations are willing to practically sacrifice themselves for that. Take, for example, today Ahmadinejad, the Persian ruler, He does not even hide his plans. He wants to exterminate the Jews of Israel. So when they told him, you are not afraid that Israel will reply, he said he's willing to sacrifice 30 million Persians for that purpose. He's willing to take the danger of destroying his own nation so that he can destroy also the nation of Israel. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I just thought about this, that uh, this is exactly what uh, Paro has done. And as I have mentioned yesterday, anti-Semitism does not begin with the death of the Christian uh, God. It does not start from then. Anti-Semitism did not start 2,000 years ago. Truly, it started since uh, Esav. Since Only Esav had an excuse. So therefore, according to the books of Kabbalah, real anti-Semitism began with the grandchildren of Esav. Sefo and Onam. So you could see now that anti-Semitism has or was already in the nature of mankind. And now we see, as long as Yosef at Sadiq was alive, since he was of tremendous benefit to the land of Egypt, so he was wonderful. The king loved him. Right? He said to him, you are the real ruler. I shall be superior to you only by the chair, by the throne. But you are the real king. And you know that in the, in the literature of uh, the Talmud and, and the Midrashim, Yosef HaTzadik is considered the Melech. And who gave him the Melucha? Paro himself. The same Paro, at least according to one opinion, because there is a machloket between Rav and Shmuel, whether it is the king who started, I mean the Paro, who wanted to destroy the people of the children of the people of Israel, whether, whether he was a, a new king or not, it's a machloket between Rav and Shmuel. According to Rav, because the Torah says, Vayakom Melech Hadash al Mitzrayim, Asher lo yada'it Yosef. And the new Paro, Rose, who did not know Yosef. So the pshat is that the, the Paro who was at the time of Yosef passed away, and now we have a new Paro who was uh, an anti-Semite, didn't like the Jewish people. But according to the other uh, opinion, no, Oto Melechaya, the same Paro who used to be very friendly with Yosef, but now Yosef is dead, and his brothers are dead, so the same Paro, he outlived all of them, according to the, to the Midrashim. Asher lo yada'it Yosef. 
Now there is no more Yosef, there is no more benefit. There is no more interest. There is no more interest. There is plenty of room now for the hate of the Jewish people. That's what happened. Exactly as it is even today and in every generation. As long as they have, even the, take the biggest anti-Semite. If he works by a Jew and he gains good money, he's going to be supporting his boss, the Jewish boss. He's going to love him and everything because he gets a, a benefit from him. As soon as he loses that benefit, he becomes the greatest hater that can be. You know, the Germans was, were very fond of their neighbors, the Jewish people. And then as soon as the declaration was made that the Jews have to be destroyed, the best friends became the greatest enemies. For a Goy to betray is not a problem. As long as there is no benefit, does not benefit him, he will go openly against the Jewish people. Today, why do we have to pray all the time? You know, we pray after uh, Baruch Atah Hashem Goel Israel. We have to say, Barichenu Hashem Elokenu, Barich Alenu et Hashanah Azot, Ve'et Kol Mine Tevuata Letova, Ve'ten Talumatar Libracha. What's going on here? We are praying not for the Jewish people in that Bracha of the Shemone Ezra. We are praying for the world. You understand that? We say, Ve'ten Libracha, Ve'atzla, Lechol, 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 Lechol Aolam. We are practically praying for the whole world to be in great prosperity. That's the bracha of Barach Alenu, right? Why? Why do we have to care about the goyim who care nothing for us? Same thing also in Chag Sukkot. We know that there were many 70 korbanot that they were sacrificed in Beit HaMikdash just because for the salvation and the prosperity of the nations. Imagine when they destroyed when they destroyed the Beit HaMikdash, they practically destroyed a source of life for them. But we keep on praying for them. Why? It's not that we have to admit that we don't pray for them for their benefit. We pray for, to, for them for our benefit. Because if there is prosperity in the world, so the, 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 you know, the feeling of anti-Semitism is more subdued. It's more uh, under control. But if there is no prosperity and no jobs and the world is, uh, is in a, a bad shape, in the first, uh, the, immediately the victim is the Jewish people. Why? Because anti-Semitism goes mamash by, by leaps and bounds. Unbelievable. You know, it's a miracle. This, this matter, one, when you think philosophically about anti-Semitism, it's a miracle. It's enough to, to get you to, uh, to understand that the Jewish people is very special. That's one thing. Another two, that there is a God. Because it's impossible according to logic that such a thing could be. I mean, even today you could see it very clearly. Anything serves them as an excuse to go after us. Anything. Like I said, I mentioned that uh, you know, a few days ago, I mean, a few American soldiers urinated over the bodies of Taliban. The whole world now is in turmoil. What's the big deal here? On one hand, we see every day how they themselves, the Arabs, kill their own by the thousands with their suicide bombing. They, they, they kill their own and nobody is saying anything. All that we hear is a report. Today, 60 people died in an explosion in a bus or in a, in, a sand, in a market. Every day, every day, every day. So the world is only reporting, but nothing. But once there is something, hi, hi, what's the big deal here? So imagine if this was, if there were Jewish soldiers who did this. Finished, that's it, the whole world would come, uh, would, uh, would practically uh, destroy us. That's the cost of being Jewish. Amazing. This is a sin, that's a hatred that is not normal. It cannot be analyzed with logic. You have to understand this. It has to be analyzed only by things that are beyond logic. And therefore you have to understand that what when our sages said, that when the day, on the day when Hashem gave the Torah to Am Yisrael on Har Sinai, Sin'ah Ha'ita Ba'olam. 
that there, there was tremendous hatred of jealousy. And who, who created this hatred? It is impossible to avoid the point, the understanding that it is God himself who created that kind of hatred. For which purpose? We understand. To keep us special. Because if there was no such hatred, the Jewish people would have disappeared long time ago through assimilation, which was obvious because when they love you and they, they socialize with you, automatically you assimilate with them. But the fact that they hate us, they estranged us, automatically we were separated. And that's how we were kept as Jews. Like the Torah says, Am levada dishkon. See that, the, the words of the Torah 3,300 years ago, when they said very clearly, in the words of Bil'am himself, to teach me that the nations know that. They know that the Jewish people is very special. And it has to be isolated. Hashem wanted it this way. The Jewish people must be separated. Am levadad, isolated, ishkon. Which means it cannot be calculated like the calculation about Goim. The way you count the Jewish people is not the way you count the nations. The nations you count them by numbers. The Jewish people you count it by concept. I mean, how many are we? And yet, look how much uh, noise we make in the world. So the way... They refer to us, it's not, it's not the way that is the normal way how you refer to human beings. You refer to us in a very special way. It is true that it is costly, because we have suffered through their persecutions. But at the same time, we gain the idea that we are very special. Now, it's up to the Jew to decide whether it's worth it or not. If he learns Torah, and he, 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 he does mitzvot every day, then... It's worth it to be a Jew, despite the fact that you have to be isolated from the world. But if a Jew, who is born a Jew anyway, unbelievable, if he is born a Jew anyway, and he does not keep the mitzvot, and he doesn't study Torah, what a pity, that's a very big, a very big uh, uh, illogical lack of benefit. You're born Jewish. Well, get to it. Enjoy the benefits of Judaism. But if you have no, absolutely no benefits from Judaism, then why? You were born Jewish for what? Just to be hated for nothing? That's where logic takes place. And this should be a lesson for everyone. Let me just in, inject there something else that has to do with this. You know, when, when Paro wanted to destroy the newly born, the Jewish newly born, he was a big hacham, Paro. How do we know that he was a big hacham? You have to understand that according to the laws of the Egyptian, the ancient Egypt, to be a Pharaoh, you have to practically know 70 languages, all the languages of the world. When a person knows many languages, he's definitely known as a wise person. He's very wise. Another proof to that. He heard the interpretation of his uh, scientists, so-called scientists, the Khartoumim, the magicians, and all the people, when they interpreted his dreams. And he said, bah, that's a shtuyot, he said. When he heard the interpretation of Yosef, he said, that's the interpretation. Only a wise person with chokhmah can definitely distinguish between the interpretation of his own people versus the interpretation of a slave, of a Hebrew slave. So we understand that this man was not just anybody. He understood that the truth, grab the truth when you understand where it is. Okay? Well, we said that when Yosef Hatzadik passed away, that's it. Times of, of prosperity of the Jewish people have ended. Yaakov survived the fact that he was in Mitzrayim. Even though that for a man like Yaakov, how can you survive in a land of Mitzrayim? But at the same time, even his children succeeded to survive 
as Jews. When I say to survive, I mean to survive as Jews because they, they kept their Jewish identity. What was that? That was instrumental to help them keep their Jewish identity. The Torah is reiterating, telling me again the names of, of, of the 12 tribes. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Issachar, Zebulun, Binyamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Yosef. Why do you have to tell me those names? We know them already. The answer is very simple. That's exactly because we read Vayhi Yaakov. Yaakov survived. How did his children survive in the land of Egypt? That's a land of Tum'ah. According to logic, they could not. But the names that they kept they insisted on keeping their Hebrew names. That helped. That helped for their survival. And now I'm going to tell you the proof to this. What, was, what happened to Paro? We said that Paro was a very big Chacham. We said that Paro was a very big Chacham. Now he decided to destroy the Jewish people. He has no benefit. What does he do? He says, Havanit Hakemalo. See again, Chokhmah. Paro is a big Chacham. He's not going to immediately declare war against the Jewish people. At that time, the Jewish people numbered in the hundreds of thousands. And he saw in them a tremendous threat to his own descendancy, perhaps. He said, No. I will not permit that the Jewish people will be superior here. No way. Let's see what to do. So he did not engage in uh, going against them openly. He wanted to use a subterfuge. How to declare, how to, to finish with them. He gathered three people. The best counselors that there was in Egypt. The first one was Yitro, the future father-in-law of Moshe. The second one was very famed Balak. name, Oyev, I mean Iov. Balak Omer, Balak Aliyah. Iov, the man who has a book in the Tanakh, the man who suffered a lot of suffering. And the third one was Bilham. So the, our sages say, he throw, when he heard the intention of Paro, fled. And that's, what he was, that's why he was Zoche, he was meritorious to become the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because you don't do this to the king of uh, Egypt. And yet, he fled. I mean, that means he left behind all his possessions. He left everything, his good name, his riches, everything. Why? So that he will not give a hand to that terrible plot to destroy the newly born of all the Jewish people. Iov was not as strong as Yitro. He was decent. He was honest. He could not take this terrible verdict. But he didn't have the guts to face and to confront Paro, so he kept quiet. Because he kept quiet, so in heaven they, de they decided to give him suffering. That's how we know that Eov suffered. It's Surin. Bil'am was the only one who not only agreed with Paro as to his intention, but he gave him also an idea. One of the things that he said, he suggested to Paro, Levatel lahem et Shabbat. You know Paro? You want to finish with them? Start first with their Shabbat. Because Shabbat is a great source of protection for the Jewish people. Decree upon them that they should not keep Shabbat. And that's it. You have them in your hands. Alright. But there was more to it. And then Paro with his Chokhmah. He said, let us destroy all the newly born. Including his own. But then he said, how am I going to kill them? Right? 
So we understand that Bil'am gave him advice. That's why he, at the end, uh, in heaven, they decreed that Bil'am should die by the, by the sword. By Yaharguit, Bil'am lefi harib. Pharaoh now is making the decision. He says, Let's kill all the newly born. Including his own. Fine. But he says, how, it's going to, how, how can, can it be done? He cannot send soldiers and kill. Then the whole world will hear that Egypt is a land of uh, a murderous land. So he said, I'm going to talk to the midwives. All the midwives. He said, the Egyptian midwives, no problem, they will agree with me. He knows that he can count on his own citizen, his own people. But he says, that's not going to solve the problem because the Jewish people are not going to accept non-Jewish midwives. Right? So that means I have to go to the Jewish midwives. But he says, the Jewish midwives are not going to agree with me. They are willing to give their life rather than to kill the Jewish babies. And a tremendous stratagem came to his mind. He says, I have an idea. I am going to declare a new law that all Hebrew women should change their names. They should change their names to have Egyptian names. I mean, they could have also their Hebrew names. You know, like today. They tell you, what's your name, I say to, the, to, to, to a friend? He says, I'm John. John? Is this the name that you were given when you were born? No! I am uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, so why are you called John? Well, that's all Paro wanted. Paro said, keep your Hebrew names, by which, uh, which were given to you at the time of your birth. Kaylee. But I want you to have also an Egyptian name. I mean, modernism. You have to be modern. You have to go according to the... Huh? So, all the Jewish m midwives they change their names. But who's going to come up? Two of the women were very great women. The first one was the mother of Moshe, Yochevet. The second one was the sister of, Miriam, of, uh, of, of Moshe, Miriam. They were both they excelled in uh, delivering babies. They were midwives. They changed their names. What was the name that was given to them? One is Shifra, and is, one is Pua. Of course, we all know what Rashi said, that why were they given the name Shifra? Shifra, in fact, is Yochevet. And Pua was uh, Miriam. So what's Shifra and Pua? So Rashi says, brings this, uh, the words of the sages who say, that Shifra, she that the Shifra, she was given that name because it, Shifra comes from the word Shapir. Shapir means beautify. I mean, she took care of the baby and she ointed him. She, she, she made sure that he is healthy and everything. And she made him look very nice, you know. And uh, Miriam was named Pua. Pua comes from the word Poe. Poe in Hebrew means talking. To talk. Blah, 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 blah. So because Miriam was when she took care of the baby, she also kept on talking to the baby. She would say, and she would make him laugh. That's why they were, she were, they were given the name Shifra. Of course, Shifra and Puha are in fact Egyptian names. But in heaven, they made sure that the names that they were given have a certain Midrashic understanding that Shifra means Mesha Peret Remember that uh, many, many of the great names that even though they were changed, but in heaven, they were already in them. In them, there was something that has to, go, to do with, with Jewishness. And that's something that is uh, extraordinary, by the way. So here is Shifra and Pu'a, they came. So you see what was the Chokhmah of Paro? What was the Chokhmah of Paro? And this thought I discovered, even though I always talk about this, that the names, you have to be care very careful about names. I spoke about this in Sodash Nishid yesterday. That... Uh, Names, people have to be very careful before they give a name to their children. Because the names is the destiny of the child. 
you are deciding about his destiny by choosing a name. If you throw a George there, or an Adolf there, or a, or a John or something, you have to be very careful. It might just influence the destiny and the character of the, of the, of the, of the, of the children. The character of the child changes. You see how deep it is? The character of a person can change just because of his name. Now you might tell me, come on, this is very far-fetched. It's not true. It is definitely clear. We see it. I mean, anybody who has a non-Jewish name, watch him. He could be decent, he could be honest, he could be everything. But something that has to do with the, the, the world, with the Goyish world, is rubbing on him. I saw this even on rabbis who took up, American rabbis who took up uh, uh, non-Jewish names. I saw this. I mean, even though they teach Torah and everything, but in their way of teaching Torah, you will see that there is an influence of the Goyim. A name. A name is everything. Ribbon Shalom, the Gemara says that Shema Garim. The name is the cause of everything. So now you understand the Chochmah of, of, of Paro. What did he mean? And this thought, by the way, what, I mean, this thought that I always say is confirmed by the words of my uncle, Alava Shalom, Rabbi Shlomo Toledano, in his book, Yakhel Shalomo. In this book, he wrote something magnificent. He says the reason why he gave them a name, a non Jewish name, he says, because if they keep their Jewish names, they will never agree to my plan. That's what, you see the Chokhmah of Paro? He says, if they keep their Jewish names, they will never agree to my plan. They will not kill the newly born. But if I give them non Jewish names, Egyptian names, they will, it will be, there will be an influence on them. And they will finally agree. Of course, it did not succeed because Shifra and Pua, in fact, did what their new, new names have prescribed for them. But that was not in the knowledge of Paro. Paro had a tremendous chokhmah in that. He says, if I give them non-Jewish names, they will not bother too much. They will, they will agree with my plan. See what the name does? That's what my uncle, Alava Shalom, Rabbi Shlomo Toledano, said. I, I'm just quoting his words. There's only two words, nothing else. He says about the name of Shifra and Pua. Yodea haya paro, she calls man she am yaledot yu nikraot bishmote maivriim. Yochebed u Miriam lo yuchal klal lavo alem beatzaa achzarit kazot. Paro knew very well that as long as they keep their Hebrew names, Miriam and Yochebet, the famed midwives, will not come to him, will not agree to him, to his terrible plot, his cruel decision, to kill the children of Israel. That's why he said to them, you change your name. You have an Egyptian name, that mother, being mother. Knowing, Savur haya. He knows, Paro knew, that when they will have non-Jewish Egyptian names, it will give them a certain influence. And it will change their character. He realize what is this? A name, a non-Jewish name is capable has the potential to change your character. Ad asheri yumesugalot lirtsoah et yalde Israel. To the point that they will be willing even to assassinate the children of Israel. You see how grave, how deep could be just then by giving, without taking responsibility over that, a name that is not Jewish to a child of Israel. So I'm going to leave you with this message. In your, even though there is so much more to say in this subject, but just to have this in mind is enough to understand the depth of the identity of the Jewish people. So now we understand why Shemot begins, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda. Why do we have to know that? We already read about it before. The answer is, you have to understand that this is exactly what gave the survival of the Jewish people there. Otherwise, who can survive in the land of Egypt? I mean, I'm talking about uh, as, as a Jew. Can you survive in the land of Tum'ah? Such as, it's impossible. But if you keep your name, you keep your Jewish identity, this will save you. 
When, you know, when somebody's name is Abraham, or Yitzchak, or Yaakov, or even Rahamim, I mean, uh, just something Jewish, it will rub on him during his life. Somehow we will see in him decency. You will see in him good character. But give him a, a Joe. Jesse, Paul. or Paul, Rahman al-Islam. Have a good week, my friends.